Now that we have our asymptotic parameter regime, we can simplify the expressions for the Hamming and GV bounds. We'll also introduce the QMERI entropy, which is going to help us do that. If you're familiar with the binary entropy function, the QERI entropy function is a generalization of that. If you're not familiar with the binary entropy function, that's OK. I'm about to define the QERI entropy function. So here's the definition. The QERI entropy function, h sub q, it maps the unit interval to the unit interval, and it's defined by this formula here. So hq of x, where x is a number between 0 and 1, is equal to x times the log base q of q minus 1 minus x times the log base q of x minus 1 minus x times the log base q of 1 minus x. That's a pretty strange expression if you haven't seen it before. Why do we care about this function? The reason we care is because the QRE entropy will allow us to simplify those nasty expressions involving the volumes of Hamming balls. More specifically, we have the following proposition. Proposition, let q greater than or equal to 2 be an integer, and let p be a number between 0 and 1 minus 1 over q. Then the following two things are true. First, the volume of the QRE Hamming ball of radius pn in fq to the n is bounded above by q to the n times the QRE entropy of p. Second, the volume of that Hamming ball is bounded below by that same expression, except with a little o of n term in the exponent. Here, we see that a function f is little o of n if the ratio f of n divided by n goes to 0 as n goes to infinity. So we should think of this term here as negligible compared to this term. Thus, essentially what this proposition is saying is that the volume of this Hamming ball is more or less equal to q to the n times the QRE entropy of p. This will be useful because it will allow us to replace all of those pesky volumes of Hamming balls in those formulas that we had with somewhat cleaner expressions. Okay, but if the goal is to understand volumes of Hamming balls and the strategy is to replace them with QRE entropy, we better understand the QRE entropy function. So let's get a basic idea of how this function behaves. Here's a picture of what the QRE entropy function looks like for Q equals 2 and 3 and 6. Disclaimer, this is just a hand-drawn picture, not, not an actual graph. But up to that disclaimer, here's basically what it looks like. So the binary entropy, which you might be familiar with, looks like this curve here. So it's 0 at x equals 0 and also at x equals 1. And it has a maximum at x equals 1 half, where it takes on the value of 1. The 3 area entropy looks similar, except it's kind of shoved over to the right. So it's still equal to 0 at 0. But now its maximum happens at 2 thirds and still takes the value of 1. The 6 area entropy is shoved over to the right even further. Its maximum occurs at 5 sixths and still has the value of 1. More generally, the QRE entropy function has a maximum at 1 minus 1 over Q with value 1, and as Q gets larger, it just gets shoved more and more and more over to the right. To get some quantitative understanding of how this behaves, let's look at the QRE entropy in a couple of different parameter regimes. First, let's consider the parameter regime where Q is really large. So let's say that Q is tending to infinity, and P is just some constant in 0, 1. So it's bounded away from 0 and 1, and it's staying constant while Q is growing. Then the QRE entropy of P, so the first term is P times the log base Q of Q minus 1. And you can check that the next two terms are big O of log base Q of some stuff that doesn't have a Q in it. This is not a technical derivation, but hopefully you get the idea. Now, these log base Q of stuff terms, as Q gets really large, these get really small. So this is approximately zero, or more precisely, it tends to zero as Q tends to infinity. On the other hand, when Q is really big, this term here, the log base Q of Q minus one, is approximately one, in the sense that it tends to one as Q tends to infinity. Thus, in this parameter regime, HQ of P is approximately P.
in pictures, that means that for really large Q, the Q area entropy looks something like this. That is, it mostly looks like the line h sub q of p is equal to p, and then there's this little doohickey at the end. Okay, so that's pretty easy to understand. When q is really big, this function basically a straight line. Great. Next parameter regime, if q is not so big, say q is a constant, and p is really small, then h sub q of p, the q area entropy of p, is equal to this. I just copied out the definition again. And once again, let's look at each of these terms and think about how they behave as p gets small. Whoops, there's a typo here. Should be a q minus 1. Okay, so this first term here, now that I fixed the typo, is big O of p as p gets small. That is, this thing here is just a constant, and there's p. This last term also turns out to be big O of p. You can see this, for example, by taking a Taylor expansion of the log of 1 over 1 minus p. That leaves this term in the middle, which is big O of p log 1 over p. That's much bigger than O of p, so this middle term dominates. Thus, in this parameter regime, the QRA entropy of p is approximately equal to the middle term, p log base q of 1 over p. In pictures, that says that if we have q that's not too big, and we focus in right near the origin here, then this kind of behaves like p log base q of 1 over p. So those are a few parameter regimes we might be interested in. There are many other parameter regimes you might care about, and for a lot of them you can get some good sort of back-of-the-envelope understanding of how things behave, either by doing an analysis like this, so writing out the terms and observing that one will dominate, or by taking a Taylor expansion and seeing what happens. Now that we understand the QRE entropy, at least a little bit, Let's use it to simplify our expressions for the GV and the Hamming bounds. Let's recall that the GV and the Hamming bounds look like this. That is, they bound the optimal rate, k over n, that's possible for a code of distance d and alphabet size q. And notably, both of them involve the volume of a QRA Hamming ball. So our strategy is to note that we have the QRA volume of a Hamming ball of radius delta n and fq to the n is approximately equal to q to the QRA entropy of delta times n, at least as n gets large. Taking logs of both sides, we see that the log base q of that volume is approximately equal to hq of delta times n as n gets large. That's nice, because this expression is a lot shorter than that expression, and now this is a function that we somewhat understand. So let's plug this in to these bounds and see what we get. It turns out that this is what we get. So here's what the Hamming bound looks like. It says that for any family C of QRE codes, the rate of C is bounded above by 1 minus the QRE entropy of the relative distance of c divided by 2. I'm not going to go through the details of how we get this, but basically it follows just by plugging in that approximation into the non-asymptotic form of the Hamming bound that we had before. It's a good idea to pause the video now and check that this is indeed legit. We can do the same thing for the gilbert varshamov bound, and one thing we could get is the following. So let q be greater than or equal to 2, then, for any delta between 0 and 1 minus 1 over q, and any epsilon between 0 and 1 minus the QRA entropy of delta, there exists a QRA family of codes, C, with relative distance at least delta, and rate at least 1 minus the QRA entropy of delta minus epsilon. Here, this epsilon is kind of a fudge factor. It's going to come out in the length of the code. That is, the smaller epsilon is, the larger the block length of the code needs to be before this starts being true. Of course, these are only statements about the limit as n goes to infinity of this family of codes, and that's why it's true for any epsilon strictly greater than zero.
Once again, I'm not going to go through the details here, but it's a good exercise to go back to our non-asymptotic form of the gilbert varshamov bound and plug in our approximation for the volume of a Hamming ball from QRE entropy and see how you could get this theorem. Okay, great. Now we have somewhat simpler expressions for the trade-off between rate and distance. What do these look like? The great thing about looking at these asymptotics is that now we only have two parameters to look at, the rate and the relative distance. We don't care about n or k or d or any of those things. Since we only have two parameters, we can plot them. So here on the x-axis, I'm plotting delta, the relative distance, and here on the y-axis, I'm plotting r, the rate. And we can plot these two trade-offs. So this red curve here, this is approximately the trade-off that the Hamming bound gives us. I say approximately because, again, this is a hand-drawn cartoon, not an actual graph, but it looks something like this. If I were to look out here at this particular combination of delta and r, the Hamming bound says there is no code or no family of codes that have that rate and that distance. On the other hand, the gilbert varshamov bound is this blue curve here. So what the GV bound says is that if I were to look at a point delta comma r down here, let's say, then there does exist a code with parameters at least that good. So down here, these are all of the things that are possible. Up here, these are all of the things that we know to be impossible. And here, at least for now, is a big region of uncertainty. This picture might leave us with some questions. First, we might wonder, are there families of codes that beat the asymptotic GV bound? That is, is there a family of codes with rate and distance that lives here, sort of above the blue curve, or here, or here, or here? Well, the answer is yes and no. So on the positive side, for alphabet size Q that is greater than or equal to 49, uh, the answer is yes. It is known that particular families of codes called algebraic geometry codes do beat the GV bound. On the other hand, for Q equals 2, that's what this picture is for. Sorry if I didn't say that before. It turns out that this is still an open question. That is, the gilbert varshamov bound, which as we saw was not so hard to prove, is actually the best known possibility result we have for binary codes, and we don't know whether or not we can do better. I find that kind of exciting. The next question we might ask is, okay, even if I don't want to do better than the GV bound, can you at least give me a code or a family of codes that meets it or comes close to meeting it? Recall that our proof of the GV bound was non-constructive. We used the probabilistic method, so we took a random linear code and observed that with decent probability, it had good parameters. So that tells you that there exists good codes, but what are they? What do they look like? Can you give me an explicit construction of such a thing? Here, explicit means either, ideally, a nice description of that thing, or at least an efficient algorithm to construct one. Once again, the answer is yes and no. So on the yes side, for large Q, the answer is yes. And we'll see such a construction pretty soon in an upcoming video. On the other hand, for q equals 2, for binary codes, once again, this is still mostly an open question. I say mostly because there's been some really cool recent work by Tosh Ma, which constructs explicit families of codes real close to the gilbert varshamov bound, sort of down in this parameter regime here. But for example, in parameter regimes up here, as of the time of this recording, this question is still wide open. Also pretty exciting. One more question we might ask that we have asked before is, are there families of asymptotically good codes? So recall from a previous video that an asymptotically good code is just a code with rate and distance both bounded away from zero. We asked this question at the end of the last video. Fortunately, for this question, we now have closure. The answer is yes. And in fact, the gilbert varshamov bound tells us that the answer is yes. For example, these are asymptotically good codes, or even these ones. So even if we don't know the answers to these really exciting open questions, at least we've made some progress over our previous state of knowledge. <laughs>
Okay, that wraps it up for this video. In the next few videos, we'll see some more bounds and some more constructions, which will help us narrow down this uh, yellow region of uncertainty here.